Real quick here before we get into the video, I wanna tell you about something that I think you might find exciting. In 2019, I started the process of setting up a group trip with Trova Trip. We were gonna to go to Italy in 2020, and we all know how travel went in 2020. But now that travel is becoming more and more of a reality and we all are itching to do some traveling, we're gonna try this thing again. We are starting from scratch again and building a whole new trip, so that's where you come into this. There's a link down in the description that goes to a quick survey that you can fill out. It only takes a couple of minutes and it's gonna allow you to choose where we go, when we go, what we do, and all those kinds of things. Once we get those details sorted out, I definitely wanna talk to you about any kind of workshops that you would want me to put on during the trip. So this can be kind of a holiday, but it can also be a learning experience or more likely a bit of both. So once again, there's a link down in the description if this is something that interests you. And not that I wanna influence your decisions on the survey, but like if we went somewhere where there were mountains. I wanna see mountains again, mountains, Gandalf. That would be pretty awesome. All right, let's get into the video. Recently, I made a video all about the brand new Sony a7 IV, and in that video, I asked you to ask any questions in the comments that you might have about this camera. That video being a bit more of a practical look, there was an actual video in the middle of that that I shot using the camera so that you could see what the quality was like and those kinds of things. But I didn't dive into a lot of the specifics that you guys might wanna know because I wanted to give you the chance to ask the questions first. I asked Sony to let me hold on to this camera just for a little bit longer. I actually got the chance to take this to to Hawaii for another project. I shot a whole bunch more on it, and today we're gonna try and get through as many of your questions as possible. Without further ado, let's get into the questions. All right, first things first, one of the biggest questions that I got was about rolling shutter. If you've watched any other reviews on this camera, you'll know that this is a bit of a problem. Now, when I say it's a bit of a problem, I mean it's about the same as it was on the a7 III. I did a test with my a7 III, the FX3, which has the same components as the a7S III, and the new a7 IV, and it pretty much came out how I thought it would. The a7 III and a7 IV have about the same rolling shutter performance, and then the FX3 totally smashed them. It looks fantastic. Now, that being said, in more practical terms, I did didn't really notice the rolling shutter being a huge problem the way that it is on, let's say, the Sony APS-C cameras in 4K. When I was vlogging with this camera, which is one of the times when you'd think you would notice stuff like this, I didn't notice it being a huge problem, especially if I had the active stabilization on, which I tried to do anytime I was doing any kind of walking and talking. So take that as you will, it's definitely there and it's really up to you to decide whether it's going to be a problem or not. Another thing that I got asked a handful of times was about the weather ceiling on the a7 IV. Now, while this is a little bit difficult to test without just like dunking the camera in some water, which I'm obviously not gonna do, I did end up in some conditions where the weatherproofing got tested while I was in Hawaii. The weather is generally pretty beautiful down there, but there are these weird little bursts of rain, and so you get caught out in the rain a whole bunch, and the camera did get pretty darn soaking wet. I came down to the beach to try and catch my first beautiful Hawaii sunrise but it decided it wanted to rain on me instead. It didn't even blink. Not a problem, nothing happened to it, it works absolutely fine. If you buy this camera, I still highly recommend that you try not to get it wet or get a whole bunch of dust in it if you can avoid it, but there's that. Then of course there's the elephant in the room, the thing that everybody wants to know about, overheating. This is a huge topic, especially because they put that crop in the 4K 60p mode, which I think was to avoid overheating. But regardless, I ran some tests last night and I was able to run both 4K 60 as well as 4K 24 for over an hour and I didn't even get the overheating symbol that it was coming up on a high temperature. Now I did my tests in this room with a bunch of like heavy lights and stuff on, so I would say it was a bit above room temperature, but definitely not like a hot sunny California day or anything like that. That being said, in regular use situations in Hawaii where it got up to like 29 degrees Celsius, 30 degrees Celsius, I never had any problems with it. One thing with Sony cameras that a lot of people forget to do is set it to the high temperature mode, which basically just means it's not gonna turn it off as soon as it starts to get a little bit hot. It's gonna allow the camera to get a little bit warmer than that before it really needs to shut down. One thing that this does make me wonder is if they could have put the 4K 60 in full frame instead of 
having that crop. They've obviously done a fantastic job with the heat dissipation and it's got the same processor as the A1, so I feel like they could have done something with it. In the previous video, I mentioned that the 4K60 crop wasn't really a big deal for me in that situation where I was shooting myself, hiking, that kind of thing. But in my trip to Hawaii, where I was trying to film others and there was one point where I was in a helicopter or in a car where it's nice tight space, even with a 16 to 35 lens on, that crop definitely did get in the way a handful of times. So again, it's a situation where it's like, it is a problem, but you have to decide how much of a problem it is for you and the way that you shoot. One person in the previous video asked about the megapixel count for astrophotography. Now, I don't shoot a whole lot of astrophotography, but I did get out the other night trying to shoot the Northern Lights out here in Edmonton, and I shot some photos on the a7 IV, as well as some with the a7 III, just to kind of see what the kind of noise patterns would be like, and generally, they look pretty similar. And this is something that I said in my previous video, if you're looking for a huge bump in image quality coming from that higher megapixel count going from 24 on the a7 III up to 33 on the a7 IV, I don't think you're gonna find it here. I think the images look fairly similar. Maybe you have a little bit more room for cropping and that kind of thing, but I didn't notice a huge bump in the change in the image quality just when looking on it on my monitor or on my phone. Definitely a big question that some people wanted answered was the video quality and specifically the skin tones versus the A7S III. So I did a test here again with my a7 III, FX3, and the a7 IV to see how the skin tones and the video quality looked against each other. What I found is that there was a slight difference in the kind of skin tone quality. I made sure that they all had the same settings for this test. The a7 III seemed to be the most contrasty and saturated in just standard profile. The FX3 had a little bit less of that contrast and a little bit less saturation, but the a7 IV had a little bit more of a green hue to it comparatively to the other two. One other thing I noticed is when I initially did the test, I accidentally overexposed a little bit. And on the a7 III, it didn't handle that overexposure nicely at all. My skin tones got really messed up. Whereas on the a7 IV and the FX3, maybe because they're 10 bit codecs, but it definitely held up a lot better when I overexposed it. A couple people wanted to know what the 1080 looked like on the a7 IV. And I'll be honest, this isn't something that I was really even thinking about. By the time that I have 4K, if I have it, I'll probably use it all the time, but a lot of people still use 1080 in their workflow if they can. So I shot some tests to see how the detail held up in a bunch of different modes. And while you can see the difference between the 4K and the 1080, I thought that the 1080 held up pretty darn well. And the nice thing about this is that you can shoot in the high frame rate modes in 1080 still without that crop. So you can shoot in your 60p or your 120p without having to do the crop. In previous Sony cameras, the higher frame rates looked a little bit worse in 1080p than like 24 or 30 frames per second, but now they've got it so that it's pretty much looking the same across the board. I thought that the 60p and 120p looked just as good as the 24. One person asked if you can monitor your audio using Bluetooth headphones, which would be a really, really cool thing to add to a camera. Unfortunately, I went through the menu system and I couldn't find anything like that. If somebody else out there has had the chance to try out the a7 IV and has found this, make sure to let me know down in the comments. Another question I got about this camera for the video side of things is what the bit rate options are. Now this varies a little bit depending on which codec you're using because we've got the XAVC-S, which is the same as our A7 III. We've got XAVC-SI, which is an all intra, which is bigger files, higher bit rates, but you've got a little bit less work for the computer to do. And then we've got XAVC-HS, which is more compressed, but higher quality. So you've got smaller file sizes, but higher quality. So most of the time I'm using all intra, which is the XAVC-SI. We've got 240 megabits per second if you're in 24 frames per second, 300 megabits per second if you're in 30 frames per second, and 600 megabits per second if you're in 60 frames per second. If you switch over to XAVC-S, which is the same codec that we were using on previous cameras, we now have it in 10-bit as well, which we saw on the A7S III and the A1. And if you're shooting 10-bit 422 in that XAVC-S, you're gonna see 100 megabits per second at 24 frames. You're gonna see 140 at 
30 frames, and you're gonna see 200 megabits per second at 60 frames per second. I think I said that all right. It's a lot of numbers and megabits and frames and stuff. And then finally, we've got the XAVCHS, which is the new H.265 codecs that they've added in the last couple of cameras. Again, we can shoot in 10 bit in this mode. We've got 100 megabits per second at 24 frames, and we've got 200 megabits per second at 60 frames. There's no 30 frames per second if you're in the H.265 codecs for whatever reason. Now, all of these have lower bit rates if you're shooting in, let's say, 8 bit, 420, some of them have 10 bit 420. So you can get a little bit smaller file sizes if you're willing to kind of sacrifice a little bit of your color quality or your bit depth. One of the cool things about this camera is that because of the 33 megapixel high resolution sensor, you can use crop lenses on it and still get a pretty high resolution. And one of the questions that I got was to show some examples of using a crop lens on this camera. So I shot some photos and some videos using the brand new Sigma 18 to 50 f 2.8 that they just put out for APS-C, this tiny little thing, such a great all around lens. And to be completely honest, I thought the quality was fantastic. You've got just over 14 megapixels still to play with, which is just over 4,000 pixels by just over 3,000 pixels. And in video mode, you're down sampling from 4.6K to 4K without any loss in quality. So if all you have is APS-C lenses, let's say you just did an upgrade from an A6600 or A6400 or whatever, then you're gonna be okay for a little while until you can afford to start to upgrade to the full frame lenses. Because you've still got crop factor, you don't get to take advantage of the full sensor, but you can get there eventually. Another big question, of course, is the low light versus the A7S 3 and I have the FX3 here, so I shot some tests with, again, my A7 III, A7 IV, and the FX3. The FX3 still, I think, is the best camera of all three of them, but the A7IV held up pretty darn well. I found that the A7IV had a lot less color shifting as I pushed up through the higher ISOs compared to the A7III, which started to kind of shift in this kind of magenta way. If you've got a scene where 51,200 is the setting that you've got enough light to be able to see what's going on, I think that you're gonna do well. Where you'll still notice a bunch of noise is if there is anything in that scene where it's still dark. So for example, in the scene that I shot at 51,200, the image looks pretty good on this white part here, but as soon as you look into the deep dark shadows, you're still gonna see a bunch of noise. The noise on the a7 IV and a7 III, like I said, was similar, except for that color shift. And then on the FX3, it held up, in my opinion, a little bit better at those higher ISOs, which makes sense because you've got a lower megapixel sensor. So each photo site is better at collecting that light and you get a cleaner image. But it wasn't as much of a blowout as I expected it to be. Another thing I got a couple of questions for was the stabilization in this camera. Sony claimed that they put a new version of their IBIS in there that was supposed to be 5.5 stops of light. As far as just the regular IBIS goes, I didn't notice a huge difference between the A7 III and the A7 IV. It might be a little bit better, but whether it's a noticeable better or not is really up for debate. Where it really shines is with that active stabilization. I definitely notice a big difference, especially in situations where I'm walking along. You can definitely get it a little bit more kind of gimbal-like without having to have a gimbal, and I absolutely love that. In this kind of just standing still, handheld at a longer focal length test, it didn't make the biggest difference in the world, but it is definitely there a little bit. The next question that I had was whether the screen is a touch screen. So we've got the new flip out screen on the a7 IV and it is absolutely a touch screen. One of my favorite features is that the touch screen actually works in the menus now. This is something even on the a7 III that did have a touch screen. The touch screen didn't work in the menu so it was only usable for like getting your focus. Now the touch screen is first of all much more responsive, a much better touch screen than it was before. And like I said, it works in the menus too so you can go through and just touch the things that you need. The next question I had was whether there was an inter Velometer mode in the A7 IV. 
And yes, there absolutely is. There was a period in Sony camera history where they didn't have it. Uh, and then before that, it was an app that you could buy that you could add in, or there was like a hack that they had for the A6500. But now it's just built straight in. You've got lots of options in there. There's exposure tracking. There's a bunch of different settings for how long you want your intervalometer to be, how long you want your initial delay to be, all that kind of stuff. It's quite handy. I actually used it the other day to shoot a time lapse of the Northern Lights. Unfortunately, it doesn't make you a video preview of your time lapse, though if you do group your previews, so it'll group any kind of intervalometer or high burst shots inside your playback mode, you can do kind of a playback preview, but it's not actually a video that it's compiling in your card for you. You can, however, use S and Q mode. The only issue with that is that it only lets you do one second intervals and it only makes the video version of it for you. So you're not getting all the raw photos to work with. I do wish they would add some kind of a video compilation feature to the intervalometer mode. That would be really cool. On the a7 IV, we have two high speed SD card slots as well as one CF Express Type A card slot that's inside the SD card slot. And so one of the questions that I got was which modes you can shoot in with SD cards versus CF Express Type A. This is a question that came up a lot with the A7S III and the FX3. There were certain modes that you needed the speed of the CF Express Type A card. In this one, I would personally say you probably don't need anything faster than a V90 SD card. In fact, even on my FX3, I only shoot with V90 SD cards. I don't think I've run into any modes where you actually need a CF Express Type A card on the A7 IV. Though it might be S and Q 60 P. Okay, so I found the one mode. If you're trying to shoot in S and Q where it automatically slows down your footage from 60 frames per second to 24 frames per second in XAVC SI, you need the CF Express Type A cards. You can shoot XAVC SI 60 frames per second with the crop and everything without being in S and Q mode just fine. But if you wanna do it in S and Q mode where it automatically slows down the footage and it doesn't record audio for you, you're gonna need that CF Express Type a, which I, I never shoot that way anyway. I'd say just go with some V90 cards if you're trying to save some money. Not that V90 cards are super cheap or anything like that. I'll leave some links down in the description uh, for some ones that I like to use. Another question I got was about the shutter volume, specifically between the A7 III and the A7 IV, if it's gotten any quieter. I remember shooting with the A1 and it had this crazy quiet shutter. So let's test it. All right, so here's the A7 III and A7 IV. So the A7 IV is definitely a little bit more dampened. I would say they're probably about the same volume, but it's got a little bit less like super high end. Honestly, I don't, I don't think it makes that much of a difference. One of the biggest questions that I got was whether this camera is worth upgrading from an A7C or an A7 III which is a really, really difficult question to answer because everyone's situation is so different. So I'm gonna kind of reiterate and maybe expand on what I said in the previous video. This camera has a lot of quality of life upgrades to it. We've got the new menu system. We've got the new flip screen. We've got the touch screen. We've got the updated autofocus. We've got a lot of new features that are fantastic as far as like quality of life stuff. Then on the video side of things, we've got 10 bit video, which is absolutely huge huge, absolutely huge. I can't tell you how much 10-bit video really helps with my video production. You can use S-Log3, you can grade it. It's, yeah, it's just, it's huge. We've also got 4K60. While it has a crop to it, the 1.5 times APS-C crop, it still looks great. It's still definitely usable. You just have to be ready for it to crop and come with the proper lenses or make sure that you have enough space to just utilize that crop. So quality of life stuff, big upgrades. Video stuff, 
big upgrades. If you're looking for photography and you're looking for big upgrades, as far as like image quality goes, I personally don't think you're gonna find it here. Coming from an A7C or an A7 III, you are getting 33 megapixels, so there is more resolution going on here for your cropping or for your printing. But when I shot side by side with the A7 IV and the A7 III, same lens, same settings, everything, I could barely tell the difference between the image quality of one or the other. And even when I zoomed in a little bit further and tried to get that kind of pixel peep thing going on, it really wasn't a huge, huge upgrade. Again, it's just really difficult to tell you specifically what you need if you already own an a7c or an a7 III. Maybe once these cameras come out, just go out and rent one and see if it makes a huge difference. And that leads me on to another question that I kept getting asked about is to compare this camera to a bunch of other cameras whether it be the R6, which is in the same kind of price category. We've got the new Nikons. We've got all sorts of different cameras that you guys wanted me to compare this to. Unfortunately, I don't have all those cameras, nor do I have access to all those cameras. What I really would suggest that you do is go take a look at some other reviews that look at those cameras and try your best to maybe pull them both up on the screen with my review or somebody else's review. See if you can spot some image quality differences. Make sure you know what the difference are in the specs and the things that are important to you. Like for some people that 4K 60 crop on the a7 IV is a deal breaker, no way. Whereas on the Canon cameras, they don't have the crop, but they might have some problems with overheating. Maybe you're only shooting in short bursts and overheating isn't going to be an issue for you in that situation. You would rather have that full sensor readout. This is all gonna be a personal preference thing and I highly recommend that you go and really do some digging so that you understand these cameras or or if you can get out there and rent them, use them and find out what works best for you. I don't wanna pressure anybody into buying a specific camera just because it works for me, but the only way that I can really do an honest review is by going out and using it and telling you how it works for me. So that's what I do in these videos. Hopefully that's also helpful for you since so many of you are also hybrid shooters that shoot both photos and videos. I would love to hear what you guys would love to see more of in these kinds of reviews. Leave a comment down below and uh, on your way down there, make sure to hit that like and subscribe button if you enjoyed this video. Make sure to hit the bell notification so you don't miss out on future videos as well. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.